So welcome to the text strand. Um, we will talk here about a core activity of textual scholarship, which is the creation of scholarly editions. So we will focus on digital scholarly editions. Uh, so to provide uh, how to provide critical representations of historical texts and documents, of manuscripts, drafts, notes, uh, prints, inscription, whatever. Uh, we will uh, not talk about a lot of things. A lot of things have been touched upon briefly already by Elena Pierazzo in the opening keynote. We won't be able to touch on, uh, on more textual analytic tools and me methods like sentimental uh, text analysis, stylography, uh, all these what's uh, under the label of distant reading. So we have to uh, ignore this. Also aspects of uh, more public uh, textual scholarship, we won't be able to cover all these aspects uh, in, in this short and brief strand. So we focus on the core activities of creating scholarly editions. Scholarly editing is defined by your textual material, first of all, and the way it has come upon us, so the transmission. Then the other uh, uh, decisive factor are our resources, human resources and fi financial resources. And then, uh, of course, the, the technology at hand, the tools and the standards that can be applied to your, uh, to your work. Uh, and then the fourth factor is your textual perspective or your, your perception of textuality and the, the, uh, the, your apprehension of textual criticism. Elena has just addressed the question, what is digital humanities? We focus on the question here in this introduction, what is a digital scholarly edition? You can uh, approach or try to address and find an answer to this question uh, from practice. Editing is a practice and you can just have a look uh, what, what is the actual practice. There are two catalogs online uh, which are interlinked. So all these slides uh, are downloadable in PDF format uh, from our website and uh, most of the screenshots uh, that I have included here in, in my slides are interlinked. So you can usually click on them and then uh, go immediately to the uh, resource that I'm uh, referencing. So there are two uh, catalogs online uh, um, on digital scholarly editions. Uh, the one, the, the, uh, the first catalog ever is, has been created uh, by Patrick Saale, a colleague of mine from, from Cologne, now in, in Wuppertal who collects information about digital scholarly editions since decades. So since 1994, and this catalog uh, has about 600 uh, entries that are browsable via categories. You feel the, the historic uh, um, uh, touch of, of this catalog, but I think he's in the course of uh, uh, Re, uh, revising and relaunching this catalog to make it a bit uh, more more uh, usable. Um, the other catalog is the um, uh, catalog by Greta Francini, now hosted in, in Vienna at the uh, Academy uh, for the Sciences of Austria. Uh, and this is a very detailed uh, and structured uh, database, uh, which can be searched and uh, contains uh, more than 300 uh, um, catalogs uh, and there is the nice um, slogan underneath the title gathering evidence to understand practice I think that's very talent I think she she uh, skipped this slogan in the revision of the presentation but that doesn't matter here you can address the question of what Oh, here's, here's just how you browse the, the catalog by Greta Francine. So that's very useful and you can have a, a very uh, uh, focused research on, on aspects that you are interested in. So if you are uh, considering to uh, create or to, uh, to design a digital scholarly edition, you really should have a look at these catalogs and check what is state of the art in your field for your type of material in your in your discipline so for this these catalogs are really indispensable and uh, really useful 
um, you can approach the question or try to address the, the question of what uh, a digital scholarly edition actually is uh, by uh, reading articles, monographies and handbooks, theorizing uh, about uh, scholarly editions. Uh, and um, one famous um, state or uh, um, uh, a set of six rules uh, has been um, uh, published or um, promoted very early in 2002 by the, so the, the by Peter Robinson, who's some kind of a godfather uh, of scholarly uh, digital scholarly editions. Uh, he started the famous Chaucer editions in uh, 1994, and they have been published in 2001. And here in this article, he proposed six rules in 2002, which still are very useful and valid, I, I would say. So a, digital, uh, a scholarly edition, according to Peter Robinson, is anchored in a historical analysis of the materials, which has always been the, the case, digital or not. Uh, it, should pre it presents a, a hypothesis about creation and change. It supplies a record and classification of difference over time in many dimensions in appropriate detail. So this is nothing new, it's, it's a, a scholarly uh, 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 way of dealing with, with text still and has always been. Uh, and it may present an edited, edited text among all the texts it, it offers. So here we get this, uh, easily or slightly into conflict with traditional philologists who always uh, want to have a textus constitutus, otherwise it's not a, a scholarly edition. But uh, for a digital scholarly edition, uh, Peter Robertson claims that it's not necessary to uh, have an edited, it may present an edited text among all the texts it offers. Uh, the fifth contention is uh, a digital scholarly edition allows space and tools for readers to develop their own hypothesis and ways of reading it. So yeah, the, the, there's a very open approach to, to your publication. And it must offer all this in a manner which enriches reading. Okay. No. Ah, and here's just a, a side remark. Um, this is a COVID special um, of, uh, of uh, the company that has been set up by Peter Robinson and his team, uh, which is now relabeled Inkless Editions. Uh, they have all been published in the, uh, at the time as CD-ROM. Uh, and uh, they are now online available, but usually with uh, restricted access. Uh, but uh, due to the um, COVID-19 emergency, there is free access to all the publications uh, um, uh, until the 1st of August. So you should really have a look in these, what one might call the incunabulas of uh, digital scholarly editions. They are slightly revised by now and uh, modernized, but uh, still. So the, the first uh, editions, so especially the Chaucer editions, are part of this set of uh, or collection of digital scholarly editions. You can also to get to an understanding of what digital scholarly editions are, uh, read uh, what has been recently labeled by Francesco Stella, the gospel of digital philology. Uh, it's a heavy beast of three volumes uh, published by, again, Patrick Saale, um, published in 2013, but started very early on. Uh, three volumes on uh, scholarly editions in German. The first uh, volume on, typo on the typographic heritage, so how our practice and understanding of textual scholarship has been shaped by the very technological conditions of the print culture. Uh, the second uh, volume is dedicated to practices, methods, and theories in the field of scholarly editing. And the third volume, in the third volume, he is developing uh, theories on the very act of transcribing, for example, or on the on textuality itself. So it's a, a very uh, insightful uh, um, uh, work. Um, and the third volume actually contains the famous it's also on the cover content or not it's I shouldn't do this the so-called text wheel text art so there's even some scholars uh, uh, got used to play a text wheel bingo so every presentation where the text will appear so you can tweet a bingo uh, 
because it's a very useful uh, model um, uh, and tool to um, when you talk about textuality. Uh, so you can, what, what are you talking about when you talk about the text and when you then plan your, your edition and uh, components of your edition? So uh, you usually talk about a text and have uh, in mind the work. So if you talk about James Joyce, Ulysses, uh, first chapter, everyone knows, okay, uh, this is the first chapter, then you talk about the same thing. It doesn't matter in, in regional English version or German version that's always James Joyce, Ulysses' first chapter. So this is from the perspective of, of, uh, of the work, but uh, that is completely different if you uh, talk about text as a linguistic code, so a, a string of letters and words. So the translations were, uh, are clearly distinct texts, so you're not talking about the same thing. Um, then uh, you uh, can talk about texts uh, or identify texts uh, when you talk about a version, so maybe a print caps or the, the, 20, the 1922 uh, edition of uh, Ulysses uh, uh, or the other version by Hans Walter Gabler so with a, a genetic uh, based on a genetic analysis of the work so then you talk about different things even though it's both Ulysses uh, by James Joyce then you can always even if you have the same version you can talk about a specific document a specific material copy and this can be very different so especially of course when you work with manuscript, they may contain the same version, but as a document, they are completely different, they have absolutely different features. And you have to be very aware of what you are actually talking about, what are you analyzing. Then uh, every text is always, uh, has always uh, come, is, is a visual sign. So um, um, written texts have a symbolic and semiotic dimension. And, uh, may be talking about the visual features to uh, to, uh, to be analyzed and presented in your edition. And then the, the, uh, the sixth dimension is the meaning of the work you're talking about, which can be uh, independent uh, from any textual material or visual manifestation, what it is actually about the work. So in this case, also at 20 minutes, uh, Performance of Ulysses on the on the, the beach of uh, of, of Dublin uh, can still be uh, the Ulysses by James Joyce, even though it's a completely different form. But you can say, yeah, that, that's it. So that's maybe the essence of, of the work. Yes, just uh, you can try to match your components of, a, of a, if you have a, an edition. That's just an example of an edition I created of. A, uh, St. Patrick's Confessio, uh, where you can uh, try to locate the various components or aspects of your edition or of your text uh, on these text wheels, so to, to see where you are very strong, which aspects you are covering and which are maybe more uh, uh, or less well uh, presented. So, but uh, if you want to avoid reading uh, uh, German uh, and uh, the book, uh, three volumes by Patrick uh, Saale, here's the excellent uh, um, handbook by Elena, which I just uh, mentioned in uh, the introduction to our today's keynote speaker. So digital scholarly editing uh, is really the standard reference work about digital scholarly editing. And you find a lot of uh, 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 information theories and uh, the whole field is very well described in uh, this this book by Elena Pierazzo. Uh, even shorter or smaller, the the newly published, uh, recently published uh, uh, book by Tiziana Mancinelli and Elena Pierazzo, che cos'è una edizione scientifica digitale? So just published uh, this uh, four months ago. Uh, and it, it's in Italian, so if you prefer reading Italian, so that should be your first choice or, to, or your starting point to get into the material. And if this is even too long for you uh, uh, and you don't read Italian, then I would like to uh, um, recommend the short article by Patrick Saale again, uh, what is a textual, what is a scholarly digital edition published uh, in uh, volume edited again by Elena Pierazzo and Matthew James Driscoll, Digital Scholarly Editing. So the slide is 
uh, interlinked in the, the, the article is freely available online. And in this article, uh, Patrick uh, is presenting three golden rules, so to say, uh, which have been his uh, guide uh, when uh, he and still is compiling his catalog of digital scholarly editions. So what is a digital scholarly edition? Uh, these three golden rules are the following. So a digitized uh, edition is not a digital edition. So if you digitize an edition as a PDF or even as a HTML version of what is has been previously uh, a print edition, uh, then it is not a digital edition in the strict sense, even though it's digital because you look at, look at it on your screen. Then the second rule is a digital edition cannot be given in print without a significant loss of content and functionality. So if you create a digital edition and you can do exactly the same without a significant loss of content and functionality in print, then it's actually not a digital scholarly edition, according to Patrick. And the third uh, rule is a digital edition is guided by a digital paradigm in its theory, method, and practice. So what does this mean? So what is a, a, a digital paradigm? The digital paradigm, so uh, that's uh, uh, a series of things, so which are, so that's a very flexible paradigm, uh, but it's definitely all about access, so the materials or part of the digital paradigm is to have information accessible on the web freely, ideally. You have space, so you have no restriction of space as by a book. Uh, you have uh, uh, various modalities of so visual, text, uh, sound, video. You have functionalities, the fluidities of text especially. You have markup, that's all part of the digital paradigm. You have the focus on the process. Uh, um, instead of the product which you have. So this is all in comparison always with the print paradigm. So a new paradigm always needs to be compared what, to what has been before to be then established as the new paradigm. So the print culture was uh, focused on the, pro on the product at the end. That was your, uh, your work or your scholarly edition in our case. In the, uh, according to the digital paradigm or under the digital paradigm, it's much more about the process of creating scholarly edition providing enhancing and progressing then it's about collaboration it's about uh, openness it's about interaction with other scholars with readers so readers become users and there's a lot of interaction and uh, participation so it, you are not just receiving what the creator the editor creates uh, but you are maybe uh, participating in the editorial pro process so that's all uh, covered under the digital paradigm. And the, the, the last aspect I want to mention is uh, transmedia, transmedialization. What is this? So that's a term also called by Patrick Zahle. So in the past, uh, uh, as a, a scholarly editor, you went to the archives or uh, asked for copies of your documents that are relevant for your text, your witnesses, uh, or your historical documents that are relevant for your research, which have been archived in the archives, safe, uh, uh, accessible to the archives hours or libraries wherever or in private archives. And you analyze your material and you create uh, um, a critical representation of these documents. So you, you all your understanding and knowledge uh, that you uh, perceive and get from the documents, you uh, put into uh, a book with your critical annotation, with a philological introduction, with registers, so everything is then in a critical representation, maybe your, your, the, the text uh, that you created is based on collation and uh, you apply textual criticism, which is all explained in your uh, philological in, uh, introduction, and you create a critical representation of the book, which then can be read by the reader, who's happy to have this uh, critical edition and is not uh, uh, it's not um, uh, that does not need to go to the archive itself and uh, get lost in the archival material. So this is the, uh, the way critical or scholarly editions have been created in the past in the uh, print era. Uh, in the digital age or in the digital work, uh, world, uh, 
we have the separation of content and form. So what does it mean? We again start from our documents. We read them, we have a look at them, we, we, uh, have, a, we have a list of relevant witnesses and documents. Uh, then we create a representation, so we create data. So it can be a scan, uh, so a visual um, an, an image representation of your document, or we encode uh, uh, our uh, data uh, according to standards or text models, uh, data models that, that we choose or that we develop. So this is uh, a representational level. All, uh, all your info, all your knowledge is encapsulated here on a representational level in your data, in your data model. And only then, as a second step, uh, this data will be presented, may be visible uh, to the user, to the reader. Uh, in various forms and formats. So it might be a fully fledged scholarly uh, digital edition with facsimiles, transcripts, XML code, uh, everything that you want with hyperlinks uh, and so on. You can have uh, um, charts, uh, st statistics about it. You can have uh, also create graphs of it. So that depends uh, and is up to your, uh, your skills and the needs of your community in what way you then present your uh, textual data. It can also be a book. And uh, ideally then the user, the reader is able to engage with your material and, uh, uh, and maybe even uh, improve or uh, enrich the data on the representational level. So that's according to your publishing uh, policy. Uh, you need to decide in how far you uh, want to uh, include the work of external uh, project participants. And of course, you can store your data in a cloud as well and on GitHub. So to uh, have um, uh, enable users also to um, uh, evitate or to, to pass your, your presentation because the user interface that makes your data visible might be your, um, uh, your biggest enemy, as uh, Peter Robinson stated so uh, the, the interface is the, the biggest enemy of the uh, digital humanist scholar because the, the digital humanist scholar wants to engage with the data itself so just a um, uh, summary of what it means to separate content and form so content representation data uh, and metadata images text markup annotations according to data models and standards. And the form is the actual presentation, the publication, visualiz visualization, uh, website as print or whatever. And it's always just one possible realization of, your, of a perspective. Information, documents, and text are maintained and represented without determining a publication format. OK. So what's the what have been the achievements so far of digital scholarly editions. Uh, one major achievement of digital editions is the provision of images of relevant documents, digital facsimiles. So bringing back into focus and raising the awareness of the material and the visual aspects of textuality of manuscripts and historical documents for paleographical analysis, codicological analysis, diplomatic, epigraphic, iconographic analysis. For this, you need the, uh, the, the images or representations of the visual features of your source, of your material. Uh, at times, you are using enhanced imaging technologies, so like infrared, ultraviolet, RTI, photogrammetry, X-ray, 3D, uh, to increase readability and support uh, material analysis. Uh, a little bit of this will be presented uh, later on Wednesday or Thursday by uh, Alberto Campagnolo. Uh, in, as part of this trend. Uh, another achievement is the provision of, uh, no, the, the provision of digital facsimiles under the, um, uh, of the underlying documents is uh, almost a requirement for digital editions. If they are not available for whatever reason, this is regarded a real shortcoming of your edition in the digital uh, context. But it might be uh, unavoidable. So, but then uh, you have to justify. Uh, the next achievement is the provision of multiple textual layers. So, digital editions are uh, uh, capable 
of uh, presenting optional presentational and analytic modes. So image text views, diplomatic, hyperdiplomatic text, uh, transcripts, normalized, orthographical, regularized versions, critical text versions, translations. So all, all together, all at once, or uh, uh, in synopsis, or in whatever way, what, what your screen is able to present in a, in a way that it's still readable. But in your data, you can have all this data uh, um, clearly uh, record it. Uh, another achievement is the provision of multiple witnesses and versions. So additional uh, scholarly editions, editions uh, can document the full history of variant and heterog uh, heterogeneous textual uh, tradition and arrange images and transcripts and synopsis and create and provide automated collation tables, for example. Uh, then another uh, uh, achievement is the whole field of annotation and analysis. So markup allows for paleographical, linguistic, metric, stylistic, and semantic annotation, for example, and a progressive enrichment of textual information. And then, of course, not to mention all aspects of functionality and access, and user interaction. So what's the next level? What's the next achievement? The next evolutional step is triggered by the idea of uh, and the concept of linked open data uh, and by the reconceptualization of the edition as a network of distributed digital scholarly resources. What does this mean? Uh, when I asked Joris van Sunder two, weeks, uh, two, two years ago or so, um, if he could write a uh, review article uh, about Mirador for Digital Medievalist, a tool for integrating digital images uh, in web resources, uh, Yuris accepted, but then came up with, a, with an article uh, with uh, the title on not writing a review about Mirador. Uh, so Mirador, Triple IF, and the epistemological gains of distributed scholarly editions. And in this article, um, Joris uh, has, makes two contentions, two arguments in favor of uh, distributed open digital editions in the wider context of humanities research and knowledge production. So the first one is to uh, support the support for quality uh, knowledge uh, uh, and expertise is much uh, better and uh, much more specific. And the second contention is that group knowledge uh, um, and distributed knowledge uh, adds up to more than local or individual knowledge, so the uh, so-called wisdom of the crowd. So this is where you can uh, benefit in our field greatly, and it uh, raises digital scholarly to a new level, and we will see in the sections, in the, in the presentations and in the text labs, organized by Tiziana Mancinelli and Daniele Fusi, uh, what this means in practice. Um, here, just a, a very uh, brief and practical example, a good example for the attempt to actualize, to realize this theory. Uh, this is the edition uh, uh, created by Jeffrey Witt, uh, an edition of a medieval scholastic corpus, which is constantly progressing, progressing and includes images of relevant uh, details uh, uh, of the text uh, provided by the servers of research libraries. So they're not part of the edition itself, but they're integrated uh, by querying these images via a IIIF protocol, which will be uh, introduced by uh, Paolo Monella on Wednesday or Thursday. Uh, uh, and um, this uh, protocol is being applied more and more by uh, research libraries so um, so this is the the next step otherwise usually in, uh, in the history of digital scholarly editing you would create data silos with with images that are part uh, integrated into integral part of the edition uh, here you have distributed resources and uh, this goes even further so this uh, the, the publication framework lombard press that jeffrey created uh, is also able to 
integrate uh, uh, transcripts, if available, uh, uh, in a foreseeable way, so via APIs, uh, to integrate these transcripts and uh, they can be also um, collated on the fly uh, with an integrate, integrated uh, collation tool. I think it's Collate X uh, or the, the, the Juxta collate, collating tool. If you are more interested into this field, there's a very good publication um, on uh, digital scholarly editions as interface, and there's also the, the, an article by by Jeffrey where he introduced uh, this um, this concept of a digital edition as a distributed uh, 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 based on distributed knowledge resources. So, um, and of course, you don't not only want to benefit from uh, resources that are provided by others, by institutions or peer scholars, uh, and integrate them, include them into your edition. You want also want to provide your own edition. So that you create a digital resource yourself, the digital scholarly edition, and you want to create it according to the guidelines, the principle that are. Uh, uh, promoted by the European Commission as fair data, so fair for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So that's the the, uh, the basis and the, the conditio sine qua non uh, for creating these new type of scholarly editions that arise on the horizon. And uh, f um, funding institutions, especially the, the European Commission, is promoting these uh, these principles and makes them even a requirement for the funding. So we need to make sure to provide our data ourselves as fair data as defined, requested and promoted by these institutions uh, to make enable others to take use of what we created, of the knowledge we created. Okay, I completely lost the time because the time is not, I am working on two screens and I have no watch here where I am. Ah, so in this sense, uh, a digital scholarly edition is the critical representation of historical, literary or documentary text established and provided under the conditions of a digital ecosystem of scholarly knowledge resources. Uh, there is much more to say, but I think uh, I need to stop here now uh, to uh, make also some practical uh, announcement and agreements with you. Here again, the, the program, we will continue at three o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, so that's in two hours, so this break is a little bit longer. Um, we will work, especially from tomorrow, I don't know in how far um, Federico and Angelo will uh, refer to uh, our starting point, so this uh, wonderful um, manuscript from the Bodleian Library uh, from around 1500. Um, the famous uh, travel report of the Venetian explorer Marco Polo um, with this wonderful illumination of the city of Venice. You can see the on the left upper corner that's the uh, should be the St. Mark uh, church with the square and the, the, the palace of the Doge and much more uh, details of the city of Venice uh, within, in, in the lagoon. So maybe uh, if Elisa um, Culliana and Silvia Marsili, who are a part of a project working on Marco Polo uh, uh, textual tradition, will be able to uh, provide more information about this particular manuscript. So otherwise, we uh, did already share, I think, uh, um, information about this manuscript and the transcriptions and translations provided by uh, 
uh, Elisa and Silvia and by Eugenio Borjo uh, from the Marco Polo project team. Uh, in the slides, there is uh, actually an appendix with much more things to say, but we skip this here. Uh, if you want to read on in your, in, in your break, please feel free to do so and ask questions uh, whenever they arise also on the material where we not have been able to talk about. So I'm stopping my presentation here and asking my colleagues my dear colleagues, what are the instructions and how to continue? I interrompo la presentazione. Are there, so first, I think we have five minutes or so time for specific questions on my presentation, which was a bit superficial and fast, but uh, that was unavoidably. Uh, but maybe there are uh, questions. You can pose your questions in your chat or we are 50 persons. You can also maybe uh, switch on your microphone and ask questions, make suggestions. Uh, and also maybe as regards then the progress of this work in our strand. I'm checking the chat. I get notes on my mobile phone. Okay, if there are no... Um... Daniel, you are raising your hand. Please, switch on your microphone. Uh... Uh, hello, Franz. Thank you so much for this very interesting presentation. And for me, one of the big questions about the digital humanities and digital textual scholarship in particular is how it creates knowledge. Um, is there a special way in which it creates knowledge? Uh, does it? Uh, um, what What are the pr procedures in creating knowledge? Because you have talked a lot about setting up data, setting up texts, but uh, textual uh, scholarship is also about um, about insight, about, about um, say about evaluating three That's different versions of the text for solving textual problems, and, and um, it's a bit of a provocative question. But how 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 would you? Okay, that's a how can we question, a very fundamental question. Uh, the, 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 the audio was not 100%, but I think I got it. Uh, so other, also others are invited to discuss this fundamental question. So uh, the production of knowledge under the digital paradigm is, I think, uh, what I tried to uh, point to as creating knowledge resources and to critically uh, create connections of distinct units of information. So to create knowledge resources, make them accessible, critically uh, identify and uh, create, establish connections be between information. I think that's so the main task of a, of a digital scholar, of a digital textual scholar, is to identify things and make this explicit as data and processable, understandable and evaluable so that you can then create it on that basis, uh, new knowledge. So it's, it's a very posi po uh, positivistic uh, starting point, uh, but I mean, that's always our dilemma, uh, but it's also fun, <laughs> I would say. And uh, then the, the, the critical task is then to uh, establish meaningful connections uh, between these units, words, semantic entities, whatever, what's, what's, your, what's your data like? And that's a very wide and open field. So that's maybe a very generic answer to a very fundamental question. So the hermeneutics of digital scholarship. So I don't know if it's a different enterprise to traditional hermeneutics or to the humanities enterprise uh, as a whole. I think it is not, but it changes the game. Uh, fundamentally, so that for sure. So, but uh, that's uh, so important that we as humanists engage with 
with the digital world. So because we are responsible for uh, critically evaluating knowledge and producing knowledge resources and ask the question and define the questions and evaluate uh, the, the, the products, if you like, or the processes. So that's, that's, the, that's the domain of us as humanists. So I'm not sure if this is the answer to your questions, uh, but I, I think that's something we have to be very aware of and also proud. Uh, so this is what we, I think, as humanists are really interested in. Thank you, thank you. I, uh, I, was, I was interested in knowledge as opposed to information, but it's a very big and very open-ended question. And I, think, I think it's a, a very good answer. If there are other comments, so everyone is invited. So this is a, a seminar situation. I don't know how familiar you are already with these virtual meetings, but most of you are, I suppose. It can also, so, but don't be afraid if there are very simple questions. So this is a, 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 um, a course which is for beginners, for you, you are considered bloody beginners. I know many of you are already uh, advanced, but this is conceived as a strand for bloody beginners. If you have never heard of XML before, that's fine. So you will know afterwards, uh, especially uh, after uh, this afternoon when Angelo and Federico will introduce you to the very basics of markup languages. So you don't have to know anything right now about this. You are, we, we pick you up as humanists, most of you, if you're an, an inform informational scientist interested in humanities, you are most welcome as well. So that doesn't matter. <laughs> Okay, if there are no specific questions, questions will arise during the next classes and maybe over the coffee break. Please uh, articulate your questions. And, ah, uh, oh, yes, nobody's, I'm not checking that there are questions in the, in the chat. I have a provocative question, the guy, I'm sorry. Uh, what is the question? Do you believe that every text or document is worth a digital edition? Uh, I feel like it's not always <laughs> so that's a provocative question but uh, that's your very personal uh, decision so that's up to you yourself as a scholar or to your uh, community of your discipline so that really depends on uh, your perspective it is interesting relevant or not so it can be highly relevant uh, a version one manuscript copy uh, of a work that has been uh, witnessed by 1,000 copies and you say this is the copy we really have to have a close look uh, and if it's only because of the methodology or because it has a value that you uh, that you of course you have to justify your choices but nobody can tell you this is uh, not uh, this is an unnecessary research. Of course, you need to justify your choices, your, your methodological choices and the choices that regard your material uh, and make this explicit. So the only rule to create uh, that, that uh, um, defines a scholarly edition is to be explicit about your methodology. So that's the, I think, the only requirement. Everything else is uh, disputable. You have to be explicit about your methodology and this methodology has to be transparent and consistent. Then you create a scholarly edition. It may be only of interest for yourself uh, or for a very uh, close community of highly specialized uh, uh, scholars from a very small discipline, but that's absolutely fine. Nobody can tell you that this is not a scholarly edition and you should make other choices. Of course, if you are depend on funding, you always have your to justify your choices. So, but that's a political and a, a question that regards society. And it's your responsibility to justify your choices, of course, under a scholastic point of view, scholarly point of view, and under, under the view of, uh, of society.
Can you say something about yeah, it? Yeah, please, please. So I'm not the, the only uh, entertainer here. <laughs> yeah. Nagaya's question is very interesting. I am pretty sure she knows a lot about mm -hmm. this. But um, for those who are not into this kind of epistemological uh, debates, I would say, I would restate the obvious. There are two answers to this. One is the ideological method, um, response that every text should be published, every manuscript should be published because we love materiality, we love the plurality of texts, and that's one approach, the new philology approach. The second kind of reply we can give to this question is the reasonable approach, the peaceful approach, which is to say every text, every textual tradition requires a different methodology. So even a classicist and a new Lachmanian can agree that uh, some textual traditions require us to give a plural edition in which we have different versions of the work, such as the uh, Romanzo di Alessandro, the Romance of Alexander, for example, the Marco Polo, Milione, etc. So some textual traditions will require us to give editions of individual manuscripts, and that's where digital, digital philology comes in handy. And I think we can all kind of agree on this. Um, the best uh, of our tradition in tech, I'm a classicist, right? So the best of the classicist traditions, such as uh, Giorgio Pasquale, has always stated that each textual tradition requires a different method and a different kind of edition. Right? Of course, there's the, uh, the other approach, the first approach that I just said, which is the ideological new philology approach, which is to say every manuscript is a testimony of a take of a state of the text but i don't think we have to get into this struggle <laughs> into these fights between new and old philology i think we can kind of agree on a common ground that some textual traditions will ask us to transcribe man manuscripts in the first place i don't know what the others think about it Um, yeah, I absolutely agree, of course. So, another question. Is there a difference between a digital edition of archival sources of one of a manuscript? Uh, Sarah, if you want to put your microphone on, you can also elaborate on this question. Uh, so what do you mean, archival sources as opposed to a manuscript? Sarah, I can hear you. If you put your microphone on, then you can explain. Or I can hear anyone. Ah, it's not working. <laughs> okay, then I'm afraid you have to write it in the chat. Or oh, I, tr I try to understand. Uh, so the digital of archive is so. In my regard, a manuscript is an archival source. So uh, for this, I don't don't see what what uh, what difference you mean. Ah, that's ah, that's maybe. If you understand archivals, yes, okay, wonderful. So absolutely, that makes a, a huge difference. So that was uh, what I tried to uh, uh, introduce when I introduced the text wheel by Patrick Zala, the, the various aspects of a text. So a text is always everything at once. So it, re it really depends from your textual perspective. If you look at it as a document or if you look at, at it more as a literary work, which has uh, includes uh, much more than uh, so much more um, uh, aspects as regards the textual transmission as uh, one single document, which might be historical, like a charter, for example. And uh, according to this choice, so if you have a literary approach uh, or a more historical approach, working on a, or concerned with a document, that makes a huge difference when you then choose your methodology. Which aspects do you want to? <laughs> Paul, oh, very nice. <laughs> You, which which uh, which aspects of this text are these more the the 
aspects of a work, the variance across various documents, or are these the individual features, material features, visual features of of your individual uh, documents? So according to that, you then make your choice. And usually, uh, yes, it, it makes a difference. Uh, but uh, as uh, uh, in the, 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 the advantage of a digital edition is you can have both. So that's, uh, you have, uh, can allow for multiple uh, perspective on your edition. You don't have to make an exclusive choice. So I'm uh, approaching this text only from the work side. So I create a critical text that represents in the best possible way all this textual transmission and uh, enables then my, my research and understanding of this literary piece as a work. You can include uh, the facsimiles, the easiest thing to do. Then you have also these representations. You can provide also transcripts if you have the time and uh, energy to do this. If you don't have it, that's, that's fine. But uh, then you have also the option to uh, open your edition and uh, increasingly enrich your data. So to start from transcripts or to start from a base text from a critical text that has been established according to some methodology, but which will then be refined and enriched with more information about your your individual uh, manuscript witnesses, for example. So you can your 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 critical edition can grow into a digital archive of witnesses, and it should in my regard, maybe only by including archival information of individual uh, items of uh, archival materials from the responsible uh, institutions, from the holder of these manuscripts. You don't, you can't do all yourself as one person, or either you do it as a team, or you include uh, and under the, the idea and the paradigm of a, of a digital uh, edition uh, um, based on uh, distributed um, knowledge resources, you include uh, information created by the specialists uh, responsible for the description of uh, an arch archival piece, for example. And then you just care about the more textual, more, more work-related parts, parts of this, this, uh, this document. And the, the important task of, for you as an editor is to identify these layers and information and informational units. That's your task as the editor. You bring all this information together. So in a critical way, not just dumping information data into a bucket or a, 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 a so you, you create critical relationships. You, you, you um, establish these relationships with your critical understanding from uh, of, of the work as a whole, which comprises everything uh, ideally and you also define what is the work so you define the corpus of of witnesses for example or what what is part what is in what is out so that's your task as the editor and you have to be very aware of this uh, when you are working in the digital because uh, there are not too many uh, editorial routines so in the traditional scholarship you follow a paradigm and you know what to do and everyone knows uh, you are doing this because that's just how you do it. You have your methodology and it is uh, very well established and you create a critical representation which is uh, can be understood and read by the people of your c community and maybe even by others, at least some aspects. But in the digital, having all these options and opportunities and additional ways of engaging with the material, you have to make uh, very many choices and be very aware of these choices and make this explicit. You always have to justify yourself. It's very tiring. Uh, but it's also uh, and it very very challenging, but also very satisfying. So you, um, it's, the, the task is not easier. So digital scholarly editing is not easier. It's much wider, and collaboration is key. So if you only make, if you are lucky and you have one witness for one work, which is not otherwise. Uh, documented elsewhere, then you are lucky. And if it's only one page, uh, then you can do it yourself, maybe, but maybe even then you are not able to create a digital resource, maintain it, put it online, connect it to other resources. Even then you need, you need a team, you need a, a center, as we are happy to uh, have established in Venice, 
or you have to have a project. Our work is mostly project related, so we don't get positions, uh, research and or professorships, and then we just do our work. We always have to uh, create project to advance our research, otherwise it's impossible. So it's not the, the lowly wolf uh, as described by, by Elena. Collaboration is always key and you are lost if you are not able to collaborate. Or if, yeah. So it's a very social enterprise, which is also the nice part, I, I have to say. So we are all very happy in it with our colleagues in Venice, I have to say. Uh, if you, if there is a question, I'm, I'm not able to follow while I talk to the chat. Please remind me or just speak up. Um, no, uh, I found a reference to Martin West, so I added that, which, which is relevant to the debate. Martin West, yeah. So that's for the for the traditional critical scholarship, the Lachmanian tradition. That's that's your Bible, uh, but uh, the yeah. One, one of the one of the gospels <laughs> and uh, but in digital scholarship uh, the approach is much broader it includes and should include also these traditional approaches of course you just don't cut with the whole tradition because there is I think uh, a very important uh, achievement from uh, what we inherited from the um, print era of humanities research and, digital, and its uh, textual scholarship, absolutely. So digital critical editions are very rare and I'm, I'm, I'm one of the few and you are one of the few who actually created critical editions which follow to some extent the traditional paradigm of providing or constitute reconstructing a text version, but uh, from a digital scholarly edition, you then expect even more. So usually, I stop my presentation with two with two grinding grindstone uh, stones, because as a digital scholar, you are um, uh, grinded from two sides. So all the the digital world with all the, the standards and progression and uh, and what you expect from a digital uh, resource and the traditional. Um, uh, expectations so that's very very tiresome but uh, yeah very rewarding if you manage to <laughs> to find a solution but of course but this grows one into another more and more in my regard I mean it's always when there is a paradigm shift shift uh, people die so it's as simple as this and uh, competences get lost that's that's a shame so uh, I don't know if today or in the next 20 years we will be able to create print edition of this quality according to the principles of these um, academic products. Uh, but yeah, because uh, there is a shift in, uh, and requirements and expectations have shifted. So that's, that's life. But I think it's a progression. So I'm still positive about all these changes. I think the, the, what we gain is absolutely fascinating and everyone, uh, so, so nobody can deny. So but this turns into a Sunday morning preacher. Um, more comments we will and we want to continue discussions uh, in the next sessions uh, 